Good vibrations, my good people. This is your host and creator of Just the Best of Are You Being Gentle with Your Mental? And you are listening or now watching our first episode of season three of a special series called Activism Through the Arts, where we will be discussing categories of social justice, environment, health and well being, empowerment, and self agency. I have been waiting to release this project and want these episodes to inspire, encourage, and help you get connected with good people out here doing the work. Today, meet Brandon Hay, who is a graduate of York University with the MES and an Environmental Business Certificate from Solik School of Business. He is a father of three boys and the founder of a Toronto-based grassroots social movement called the Black Daddies Club. Currently, Brandon is attending Jusult Institute of Toronto, working towards becoming a therapist in their five-year program. Brandon works as the community development officer for the city of Toronto, and his portfolio includes programs such as support for families program, workforce development, and youth employment initiatives, and the Community Health Project, which is a $6 million investment in the Community Healing Initiative focused on supporting youth who are most vulnerable. We love that. You know, Brandon is a strong believer in equitable and innovative approaches to his community work. He works with an intersectional lens around issues of marginalization, most importantly, he brings 10 years of mobilizing community-based research, event planning, and leadership expertise to this role. Just brilliant and incredible. Let us dive into this mindful discussion with Brandon Hay. Hello, hello. Welcome to Are You Being Gentle With Your Mental? Today we have a special guest, Brandon Hay. How are you doing? How's your energy? Good vibrations? I'm good, man. I'm really, it's the end of, end of the day here in Toronto, but I know you guys are three hours back, so I'm trying to match yours. Um, but it's a blessed day. I'm super excited to be here, man. Thank you. Thank you so much for even connecting with me. I know we recently met this year um, from one of my soul sisters, Mona, which is out there in Canada. And it's Sister just... Mosa. Sister Mosa, yeah. Yes. Sis... Oh, yes. Sister Mosa. My apologies. Yes. But Mosa, she's just an incredible artist um, out there and doing amazing work as well as you are. Um, but just, you know, even with today being 420 and just even hearing the news that we just received, Received not too long ago with George Ford's click killer, you know, he's been found guilty on three accounts. And so just what are maybe some of your thoughts and feelings around that? I mean, I think in this, in this time, I'm, the time of like, um, I think straight away, I'm, I'm, I'm happy that there's, there's justice. Yeah. Um, but I think in this time of social media, like I follow Sean King, um, and there's always like, there's always something. There's always, there was always, you know, this is a, 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 this is a guilty, but but there's so many not guilties that happen, right? Like that it doesn't, like you have to be grateful, but in, in the bigger scheme of things, it's, it's like, it's a long way to go. And it's, and it's, it's constant. We don't even get that chance to necessarily sit, heal and, and feel it. There's, there's an onslaught of another, Black killing, a black oppression, and, and and you know, it gets tiring. Yeah, it gets most, tiring. Most definitely, and you know, it's just kind of like chipping away at the ice, at least right now. And 
there has been, we're looking for change really in our community. Um, and I think it begins with like you and I and like policy um, as well being enforced and, and different laws, of course, uh, being placed ac across the states, across other countries as well. And so, you know, maybe something that we can even just share with um, maybe, you know, just walk me through your upbringing. I know you were, were raised in Jamaica and transitioned over to Toronto, but how was that for you? I mean, yeah, I, I, I left Jamaica when I was 10. And that was like that was home, you know. It's it's still home in, in some ways, and it's and and it's and it's shifted over the years, you know. But Jamaica is where that that was foundation music for me. That's where I got all like the, the roots. And I think when I came here to Toronto, there was a a coldness um, that I can't explain, right? Like there's a, a removal um, that I wasn't used to. And I didn't know if it was because I, my thought process is like, okay, because of the winter, people are just like generally colder, but I've been back to Jamaica since. And I think as a black man, there's something about like, so, you know, on, on, our, on our subway lines here, um, the, the, you know, as it is right now, the most West location on the, the Toronto transit or TTC um, is Kipling and you have Kennedy. Kipling in the West of the city, um, and Kennedy in the East. And, you know, on the train, you know, during rush hour, it can get from one end to the next in like 45 minutes an hour, give or take, right? And I've noticed that as a black man, I could sit in a seat and, and my seat beside me will be empty for that entire um, journey. If, a, if it's, a, if it's a, let's say a black woman, her experience may be different, you know, like her space is taken up, you know what I'm saying? Where I get a lot of space because I'm a, I'm a black man, six foot, bigger body that it's sort of like, and as soon as I get up, people rambling for the, the seat. Where when I'm in Jamaica, it's like people, it's like, it's hot, you know, people are sitting beside you, their, their, their sweatiness is touching. And there is like in that sweat, in that muck, that's like, that's, there's a connectedness. Mm -hmm. that I miss, like people give you the, when I was growing up, people would give you their kids to hold, you know what I'm saying? Or you may see, you know, you give a person like an elder or whatever the seat. Um, but there was a, a kind of, what you call it? It's, it's like in my, growing up anyways, it was like this, um, this automatic familiness, if that makes any sense that you just, you know, that was the home. I guess that that's where that connection to home was, you know? Yeah, most definitely. I can understand that. And what made you choose to like travel then and transition to Toronto, like out of all places? You got to ask my mom that, yo. Like I was 10 at the time, yo. So, yeah. um, but I think it was just like to give her son and give her, herself a better chance, you know, like it's interesting. She worked in a bank um, in Toronto, I mean, in, in Jamaica. And then when she came here, she was cleaning banks. You know what I'm saying? But she she's a hard worker. She went to, to school and she got a good job. And she's, you know, she showed me the um like hard work ethic. You know what I'm saying? Um and I think I, I definitely get that from my mom, you know what I'm saying? Like this 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 work hard vibe. But again, I think with a lot of black parents, when you 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 either migrate here, there is this narrative that you tell your children that yo, you have to because you're a black youth, you have to do much harder. You know what I'm saying? You gotta work that much stronger or or, or so forth. You know what I'm saying? Um, where I, I wonder if, if back home in Jamaica, if there would be a, a different kind of vibe, if, if the messaging would still be the same, you know? Because of your blackness versus something else, but yeah. Yeah, I could definitely um, resonate with that as well. My father, he's from Haiti. And so with being a first generation, you understand the privilege and also um, just the where your ancestors came from and fought for. And so I really know it's up to us to be the change and not like look over the shoulder for somebody else. Um, it's more about me looking into the mirror about what I can do. And I think we actually have something in common with that as far as our movements and of healing in our communities. And I know you're the founder um, of a Toronto-based grassroots social movement called the Black Daddies Club. You know, when did that begin and why? Yeah, I mean, so in 
2004, um, my father in Jamaica got murdered um, by an 11 year old boy um, who two weeks later got murdered by the same people who hired him to kill my father. And I think in going back home to Jamaica for that, to bury my dad, uh, the direct, the, the, the detective that was handling my father's death um, said like it was normal, you know, like this sort of thing. He said this, this statement, like this is this sort of thing happens all the time or it was normal. Um, and for me, I was just like, yo, uh, an, uh, an 11 year old kid um, murdered my father. And then two weeks later, that same young person gets murdered. And that's taken up as normal. And, and I didn't want to believe that. I didn't want to accept that rather, you know? And then I think I started to, I had that, it was like, yeah, it, it, it hit me that there was like this normalization of crisis in black communities globally, not just in Toronto, it's also in Kingston. It could be in Brixton in England. It could be in the States, choose whatever city. But if there's black people, going back to your initial question early on, if black people's bodies dying, it, there's a, it's, it's normal. It's, it, you know, um, I was watching Selma on the weekend and I was bawling my eyes out. And I've never watched that movie, but that like to see that scene on the bridge and I was just like, yo, like this is where it was coming from. You know what I'm saying? And it's like, this, this is black bodies being injured is nothing new. Mm. And I think this idea of being resilient or tough or whatever, I mean, it's, it's something to, to think about it, but it's, it's, it's tiring, you know what I'm saying? Um, but in terms of Black Daddy's Club, I just didn't want my, my, my dad's death to be in vain, you know? So that was sort of the, the switch or the, 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 the match, so to speak, in, in 2004, um, but it was launched and it, it, it took a few years I had to go th like it, it, in 2008 is when we started um, to actually to you know to actually um, go out into community, um, and we started with barbershops, and we knew that barbershops was a place where black men, especially here in Toronto, is where we we you know it's it's sort of like it's normal for us to go and talk. You know what I'm saying? For us a reason, and especially where there's like a high you know, we were placed in, 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 in Toronto called Little Jamaica. Um, that's where like, you know, all these barbershops are at. So that's where you see, you know, black, you know, African, Caribbean, Canadian men congregating and talking like it's normal because I think in other spaces, you don't see, you, you don't really see black men in, in um, unapologetically speaking and taking a space like you, we see in barbershops, you know what I'm saying? So again, those places feel like home. So we, we use those conversations and then we, we use those, those, those dialogues to, to ask black men, what do we need? You know, talking is, you know, so some black men were like, yo, like, <clears throat> or dads were like, yeah, like these talking are great, but when I have my kid, I don't want to come and just sit and talk. I want to do stuff, you know? Um, so we started a program in, in, in partnership with, uh, with, with an organization called Kids Up Front. It was called Daddies and Me, where we got, tickets donated to different outings and, and and we would go as a group of black fathers with their children to like um to watch like you know Circus du Soleil or go into a sporting event or go to the art gallery um <clears throat> but over the we've been around since 14 like for 14 years um and we've gone in different areas basically um but it's definitely grown from you know hearing what community is saying and, and moving from, from, from there. I love that. And, you know, where do you see like VDC in the like next five years? I think, yeah, I think going into, into offering therapy for black families, black fathers, um, <clears throat> I think, yeah, in the last, Two years, I've went back to school to take um, Gestalt um, to become a, a Gestalt therapist, um, and I think this is a, an extension of the the, bar the work we're doing in the barber shops, right? Like, you'll see it. There's there's a couple things, right? So you'll see 
when you go in a barbershop and it's like like all black men um, in the space and we're talking, I'm gonna say some real stuff. And then a, a, a woman comes in, you know, worse if she's, you know, attractive, then men sort of switch up, like they, they sit up straight and they, the, the, the conversation may go in a different direction. There's a performance that starts to happen. Um, but I think very rarely do we have spaces where black men can just connect with other black men and just be real and just say, yo, like, I see you black man. Like I'm going through the same shit. And it's such a healing vibe, even for myself as an organizer or core, I see that's core organizing. Cause these men are like, without them, it doesn't happen. Yeah. You know what I'm saying? My job is to build it and co-build it with folks. That's really it. Like, you know what I'm saying? And it could be two, it could be one man show, two man show, or, or 50 men that show it to like a Sunday dinner, but it's to make sure that it keeps it happening. And, I, and, I, and it, it, the work is tough because it's like, I do my day job and I, for the last 14 years, I've had to have a day job, whether it's working in a factory, doing security or going back to school to like, because it's just like, yo, you know, as a black man, certain jobs are not there for me. Mm. And it's like, I need to get some letters behind my name so I can get more options, so I can co-parent, so I can actually feel like a father and not feel like I'm another dependent for my partner. You know what I'm saying? So it's like, there is the society says, Yo, this is what black man is supposed to be. Worse now, there's like social media where everybody is rich. And it's like, if you're a young, if you're a young parent, um, and you're seeing that and you're like, yo, this is where I'm trying to be, but my reality is here. Mm. There's a loneliness in between. Mm. And I think we need to have more spaces where we can talk about that loneliness, those spaces of vulnerability. And it's very difficult, I find, and it takes practice. You know what I'm saying? It takes practice for us to talk to other men, but it also takes practice for us to talk to with, with, with our women, if, if we're talking about like heterosexual relationships, you know what I'm saying? So it's like, you know, and I've seen that, like even in barbershop sessions, sometimes we have sessions where it's both men and women and it's, it's powerful, but it's for me, I've learned a lot from those spaces as well, because I've seen how, like when men sometimes start being honest, I've seen women start to shut them down. Like, because so, two things that happen. There's the, the blessing when you go into a barbershop, you hear other people talk about things that may be coming up in your relationship that you don't have to say, you don't have to out yourself. Mm. So you can just li listen back and be like, cool. But on the flip side, I may say something that triggers you because you're going through something that you've, you, you, you've experienced this in some way and it's, it's like a trigger. So me even saying that in that response, so I've heard women start to like a man say, yo, this is my truth. I'm in a relationship. It's hard for me to be monogamous because women are coming at me. It's not a right or wrong. It's just that he's sharing his truth. We're, we're just talking about what's happening. And I'm seeing where women start to respond and, and, and shut him down and just like negate the truth. And he sort of withdraws. Mm. He withdraws. He goes back into this performance, this performative space. You know what I'm saying? He goes back into the mind. He was in his body for a minute, going really deep. And because you can tell, like, you can tell the, you know, in the barbershop is about bravado. You know what I'm saying? Like, that's how, but when you see a man trembling and he's like hitting an eye, he's, he's saying some shit, some, some real stuff. Yeah. And I saw where he was trembling and, and, and the women was like, nah, 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 this. And then he just, and then he came back with the bravado. Like you see the switch. And I think, I think what I'm getting at is that I think we're still learning. I and mean, we think we need these spaces, we need to create more of these spaces, whether it's, we don't have in person, but we have to go virtually now. We have to have these dialogues where we can sort of go and practice. Cause I didn't grow up seeing this relate. I grew up with a single mom, you know, she did the best job that she could. You know what I'm saying? She did, she was brilliant in terms of engaging me with my uncle. So I had different types of masculinity that I can pick and choose from. But she also recognized that, yo, I'm a woman and I'm raising a, a, a son. His, he can't go to his dad's place because we're in a country. So I have to do what I can. You know what I'm saying? So for me, I came into fatherhood, again, watching shows like The Huxtables 
but not knowing how to be a father. I didn't have a well of experience to kind of draw in. So I, creating Black Daddy's Club was actually a way for me to connect with other Black men and Black fathers to learn. You know what I'm saying? Yes, most definitely. And I, I think I, I love the fact that you have this really special virtual event called Sunday Dinner with all Black men. It's really a dialogical approach to community for healing. Um, and I know I wish I could be in those in those calls, but I think that's also something, as I mentioned, that we have in common with creating virtual space uh, ever since the, the pandemic hit. But maybe what are some of the favorite moments, you know, from creating these um, these dialogues that you have every month? I think, you know, um, the idea came from as a. Uh, I'm, I'm, I'm writing this, this paper, this, 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 it's not like an academic paper. It's just like a, I just want to write this paper, yeah. you know, and it's about the influence of the black and racialized LGBTQ, um, 2S plus community has, how, how it's influenced the black daddies club over the last 10 years. And a, a friend of mine, a brother of mine, um, his name was Ajamu. He's a, um, an educator and a fine, a fine photographer um, and an activist. And I met him in 2017 in New York, in Harlem at this uh, gathering. It was a week on gathering called House Lives Matter that uh, our brother Michael Robeson um, co-organized. And I learned a lot about um, my blackness, my masculinity. I had to push past my, my homophobia. Um, and, and I'm still pushing past my homophobia. That's a part of the work. I'm still pushing past my, 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 my patriarchy. I'm, I'm still learning beyond these different things. It's, it doesn't stop. You know what I'm saying? Um, but Ajamu was talking, his work focused on like sensuality. And I was thinking about, I was writing about this week, but he, he, he was the first man that I, I saw talk about sensuality, talk about, and not from like this academic sense, like we're talking about like, you know, like Audre Lord, um, nothing's wrong with that, but I'm talking about like the, the smut, talking about the sex and the filth. And hearing him talk about black joy and black sensuality, I've never heard another man talk about it, that it wasn't in this way. I'm not talking about black porn either. And I'm not saying one is dirty or whatever, but there was just an intentionality behind it. Because I think with like say black porn, black men can be the, 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 the receiving lens, if that makes any sense. Um, where I think he was saying, yo, like I'm a black gay man and, I'm, I, and, and I enjoy sex. And I'm proud of my sex and my sensuality. And I was, I'd never heard someone talk about it like that. And he talked about, there was this gathering that they did in person in the eighties and nineties where they had black men, gay men, um, and, 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 and bi bisexual men collect and chat and, and reason. I was like, yo, that space sounds brave, yo. Because I was worried about homophobia. Like what would happen? Cause I know when I go into the barbershops and we've done conversations around, you know, homophobia, yo, like, a lot of homophobic shit comes out. You know what I'm saying? And it's, a, it's a, for me, it's like, can, can we really create safe spaces or we want to create brave spaces? And mm -hmm. what's the difference? But, you know, how do we create spaces that all of our blackness can come in? That my blackness as a straight man doesn't get over, doesn't overpower your, your blackness as, you know, someone who is gay or a trans man or bi, et cetera, et cetera. You know what I'm saying? So when he said that, I was like, right away, I wanted to create the, recreate the space. I wanted to do something because they, they, they stopped running it in the nineties in England. And I was like, I want to do that here. So when we turned on our 14th anniversary and then with COVID, I was realizing that, yo, I was, I was needing a space to connect with other black men and I know that other men just in conversations were talking about. So even, you know, in some ways, even um, George Floyd's death was a part of the, the, the co-creation of it because 
I was talking to men and they talked about like early on in the pandemic when all these black men were getting murdered, they're like, yo, they're talked about this numbing that they're doing. I was like, yo, how, what's your thoughts on, the, you know, that, that brother got killed in the States. And they're like, yo, to, to be honest, B, I'm trying not to even think about it because I don't even have those spaces for me to release or even to like heal. You understand what I'm saying? So I can't take on all this shit right now. You know what I'm saying? Like, I don't know about my, I don't know about my job. I'm seeing black people getting killed. My kids are not in, in you know, I'm home with my kids and you know, there's, I have, a, I have a lot of shit on my head. You know what I'm saying? So I can't, so after this numb myself, I can't even afford to even feel it. Mm. You know what I'm saying? So I think, yeah, like I, I think I'm on a little tangent there, but like, I think, <laughs> I don't know if I should just pause because I never know where to go next. <laughs> you're doing, you're doing so fine. And just the way you're, you're sharing your story is just honesty and authentic. And so thank you. Uh, for being that for being that kind and I just want to know you know at these events how can others get involved I mean we, we you know you, you can go onto the black the the black daddy's club website so t-h-e black daddy's club.com um we put a, a posting on eventbrite um that's where you can find it um but even you know shoot us a note info at the black daddy's club.com um, and just to find out if you want to get, you know, connected, I think, you know, what was interesting, we a brother from, from Edmonton reached out this week and was like, yo, I'm a single dad. Mm -hmm. And he's like, yo, do you have a, um, a, a chapter? I know he's like, I heard about the work you could do in Toronto. Um, but is there, can we do a chapter, um, here, you know, and I was like, yo, for sure. Like, like it's like, I think that's also the, the, the point of the work is for us to sort of, it's not to go necessarily wide. We want to connect, but we want to go small and deep. So mm -hmm. if we have a couple of people in, in foreign, some last week, last month, we had folks from Brazil. And I think it's important that we make these connections to make the borders, that's, that's the benefit of this virtual gathering. We're mm -hmm. making the borders smaller, but we still want to connect with where we're at because what, what's been coming out, men are like, yo, this is great once a month, but I, I'd love to connect with can we connect in between because shit is coming up like stuff has happened for me you know two weeks out from a sunday then i'm like yo i wish the session was coming up this sunday you know what i'm saying and it's like that there's a necessary there's a want to reach out um and as i get older you know i don't have as many male friends to like engage with right and i think a lot of us you know as we have families and all these different things we isolate ourselves, you know what I'm saying? And I think having these spaces where we can sort of, and you know, and also the big issue as well is like, we've changed. We changed from when we were young to older, so we may not connect with the same thing. So if you're, when you're in the space, it doesn't matter if someone is, you know, straight, gay, or, you know, trans or non-binary, there's still a connection. I think to back to your question of what are the things that I'm, I'm seeing or what, what's, what's, what's um, resonating with me is I think, creating a space where we're seeing black men from all different entry points, right? And not just for it to be centered from a heteronormative, but give space for black men who are gay, black men who are trans and non-binary, et cetera, um, for us to come together and, and, and engage as human beings, as black men, um, and for us to co-build co a space, but we also co-teach and co-learn. And I think that's that's been the beautiful thing. And the agenda is co-created by the folks um, in the space so I think, yeah, I, 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 yeah, that's definitely the, the piece. Yeah, and you know, it's so important because even with the space that I work around with co-creating uh, the Day of Healing, um, I know that I would love to see more Black men, more men in these spaces. Um, you know, I'm seeing about 1% present at our at our sessions and we do them three times a day so we try to make it accessible for everyone's schedule um, where we have one in the morning at nine then you know one at two um, around lunchtime and then maybe in the evening um, and we were doing the monthly last year but now we're, we're on a quarterly base and you know providing space for for out out other than just the day of healing, I've also opened up my services as a mindfulness coach um, to have learning calls with one another. But 
I love what you guys are doing with uh, Sunday dinner because it really is like just community coming together and to sit and to to eat and to discuss. Um, and I would love to just see like those two, like the Day of Healing and Black Daddy's Club even mesh together because we, I want to see men, how they can be vulnerable in spaces, but also be accepted in spaces as, as well. I want to be able to see men be able to know how to meditate and have these tools to hold on when they're having those moments like, oh, wait, I wish I had this. But no, you have a tool. No, you have yourself. No, you have uh, the consciousness of a higher being that you can connect to. Um, and so... You know, just personally, me growing up, I had a very large family dynamic. I actually was the youngest of 14. And so like the, the presence of my father wasn't always there, but I knew that um, when growing up that there was needing to be forgiveness and that I still needed to have co-create my own world and know that that, 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 that was healing. And so um, there's a lot of inner healing that I also have with doing these spaces, but I know it's important what you're doing. So I really commend you um, with being able to have black fathers there and present because there's a stigma around black fathers. Oh, they're not there or, you know, they're absent or they're deadbeats or whatever. And we can change that. And you're, you are changing that. Um, so I really commend you on, on the work that you're doing. It's, it's truly phenomenal. Appreciate you, sir. Appreciate you, man. And likewise, I think the work that 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 there's that definitely that connection, um, and collaboration, which you kind of touched on, I think is is over the fourteen years. I think that's how we have to grow. Um, I think these cross borders collaboration, um, as I mentioned before, I think that's that's definitely the future. You know what I'm saying? Back to your question, like in terms of that's been consistent, but it's been the future, right? So cross borders, but also, um having conversations and partnership with different forms of blackness in the sense of not different form, but different entry points of blackness. So like the disability, um, talk about disability, talk about um, sex workers, all these like, so like, you know, there's so much, um, I think one of the, the, the things that I'm, I'm learning as, as I do this work is, is, is not to center myself so much um, as a, a black straight man. Right. And I think this intersectional lens has been like really important over the last, you know, seven years on doing this work. It just, it just, I think when I started this work, it was very focused on, yo, the oppression of black, black men are going through. But then when I started to look at this, the lens through, look at the, the oppression that black trans women are, are going through and realizing that like all these different intersect, it's all black. You understand what I'm saying? So if that person is not liberated, then I'm not liberated. You know what I'm saying? I can fool myself. And tell myself, but reality, if 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 like, it has to be a collective approach, you know. And and I think um, not everyone sees will you know will agree with me, and I think that's okay. You know what I'm saying? But I know who I want to build with, and who have a different vibes. That's all right. You understand what I'm saying? But yeah. Yeah, you know, definitely, we have to just continue to just move that needle in our own spaces. Um, uh, and I know you're doing that also too in the city of Toronto as a community development officer. Mm -hmm. And so when working with youth, what are most of the youth out there seeking? I mean, you know, in, in, um, yeah, like I, I, I'm fairly new to be honest, um, but I have three programs. I'm gonna talk about one, one of the, the, the programs in my portfolio and it's a project called the Community Healing Project, um, where basically we work with young people to work with other young people who are deemed as um, most vulnerable youth um, who living in certain communities, um, whether it's marginalized or we call it, it's called neighborhood improvement areas, NIAs. Um, but if there's been a trauma in that community or we work with youth, to basically go in who have experienced some form of trauma um, or have or could but live in a community but and then they they also go and do healing work so we train them how to um, some of the tenants um, of, of healing um, and we teach and, and basically they go out and do that work um, I've been with the or I've been there I've, I've heard about it from community for a while but I've been there for the last month and it's been really interesting hearing about just, you know, 
some of the work that's happening. I think the, the learnings that I'm taking from it is that I think young people, it makes a difference when, when, when young people get that language. Mm -hmm. Like I have three boys, you know, um, 18, 21, 20, 17 um, this month, and then another turning uh, 15 next month. And my 18, I was having a conversation with them on the, we're playing dominoes and I was having a conversation with them. I wanted to have a conversation, not just about sex, but like um, treating a woman's body properly, right? And respecting a woman's body. And I was sharing with them, I was like, yo, when I was younger, you know, I didn't necessarily have the same mind frame that there was, you know, there was this idea that this masculinity vibe, not to, uh, not to, to hurt anyone, but my, my needs came first. Mm. And my 18 year old look at me is like, well, you, you didn't know that kind of thing. And I got a little annoyed, you know what I'm saying? But my point I'm getting at is that like, I find like my, my kids or my children now are, are, are way more evolved than I, or, or than I was at that age is what I'm getting at with the, the, the information so quick and accessible um, and things that I'm learning, like I had to relearn and unlearn in my thirties and even my forties, I feel like the next generation, it won't be, you know what I'm saying? It's, it's, it's not, um, I don't feel, yeah, I don't know. I feel, I, yeah, I, I, don't, I feel like they're learning a lot quicker. You know what I'm saying? Um, I can't, I forgot what, what, what the question you asked me where I went, I was going with you know, that. You actually spoke about the next generation and that brings me to another question. Like what are maybe three things that you can encourage then to the next generation since they are learning so fast, um, you know, of leaders that they can value? Well, I think where, where I was going with that in terms of the next generation is one of the things I've noticed that is like here in Toronto that we don't have enough black um, therapists you know, and enough black male therapists, and then to throw in all these different intersectional points, I think, you know, not to say everyone has to be a therapist, but I think this work of healing, keeping with the theme of healing, I think it's important to find a therapist that looks like us. You know what I'm saying? Like I've, I've been to a few therapists and it's tough to like explain. <laughs> explain your plight as a black man and get people up to speed. And I'm like, fuck, I'm paying you to, to teach you. Like, this is like, you know, whereas I think, again, the, this is the beauty of like, say the barbershops for me anyways, or, um, you know, Sunday dinner. I think you've been said like doing this work, like you create this space, but like you leave these spaces feeling healed yourself as a co-organizer because you okay. see yourselves in the stories of the people that you're sharing the space with. When I leave those spaces, I feel full in a good way. I feel rejuvenated. Mm -hmm. You know what I'm saying? Um, and it's a beautiful thing when I'm sitting beside a black man and he's saying, yo, this is what I'm going through and I can connect and I don't have to say a word. Mm. You know what I'm saying? So it's like we need more folks, young people going, you know, um, with lived experience, not just book smarts, but street smarts that become therapists that who have those who've been through trauma that can speak because you're not alone. I think that's the other piece I want to let people know. And that's a reminder for myself is that I'm not alone. You know what I'm saying? And sometimes even though we and, and I know COVID can like heighten that social media can heighten that. Um, but the reality is that like a lot of us are going through, you may think we're, you know, we're isolated. Um, but when I go and um, choose to be vulnerable in certain spaces, um, i.e. let's say Sunday dinner, um, or even with someone in a closer knit, um, that's when I find, when I'm vulnerable and truly honest, and it's like really scary is when I find that sometimes that resonate the most with people because that's what they're going with. You know what I'm saying? So there's a, uh, I think there's a braveness in speaking, mm. you know, um, and speaking from the heart and speaking from the body. I think we're so conditioned. I mean, I'm just speaking for myself. I, I know I'm so conditioned to like speak from my head um, and live in my head that to train and I'm still doing that to get to and meet my body is ongoing work. It's new work for me. 
it's not something that I, those, those taught to me in school, you know what I'm saying? Yes, <clears throat> it's a space where you have to learn every day. I tell people it's like a light switch. You're gonna have to turn this energy on and be in this space. And that's why even beyond this, you know, it's gonna be up to you to be able to, to continue the healing. And so it's a movement where we've called it Choose Unity for Community. And, and it's you and I that continue to show up in these spaces and that we can really uh, see the world evolve through mindfulness, uh, through healing and, and through transparency as well and accountability um, as well too for, for our actions. Um, and so, you know, something that I, I really love what you're doing, you're really changing the narrative because you're also in training to become a therapist. Um, as you've shared just your experiences. So how is training going for you? And, you know, maybe what are what are some reasons that motivated you to continue your studies? I mean, um, so for myself, four years ago, I went through a separation from a 16 um, year old mar marriage. Um, and that's when I, I started to go to see a therapist. And I thought, like, I'd stopped. I even paused doing some BBC work, Black Daddy's Club work, just because I felt like a fraud. <laughs> you know, I felt like this idea that, you know, how can you be doing stuff around Black fathers when you're like, you couldn't make your marriage work? You know, words like failure came up. Um, and I also recognized that. There's some very toxic shit I learned as a young boy that manifested this way as a man that wasn't serving me any purpose anymore that I wanted to shed. And I didn't know where to start. I knew I wanted to do it. I just didn't know how to do it. And um, when I heard about this program, the Gestalt Institute of Toronto, so Gestalt was, you know, it's a five year program. The first two years I, I was, you know, basically working on myself. Um, I think the entire time you're really working on yourself for the most part. But, and I, it, it appealed to me because I was like, yo, A, I like the concept because it's like, I can't work, I can't support you if I don't know how to support myself and I can't see my blind spots and so forth, you know? But I think from a grow, I, 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 I I look at learning as continuous, man. I'm super curious as a human being and I like to learn. I like to learn about myself. And then I think as a father, I wanna teach people to pass on things to my youths, my, my boys, them, you know? Um, that they don't have to fight through the muck as much. I don't, you know, I, like I feel like I've, because I didn't necessarily have you know, my dad got taken away from me way too early. I didn't have that much time to really there's so much questions I have for my pops. Mm. You know, there's so much grieving that I have, you know, that um, that I want to reason with them and find out because I, I, I struggle with certain things that I saw him struggling with. I'm just like, yo, what was this about? Can we talk more? But that's not there. You know what I'm saying? So in some ways, I've had to, I think where I'm at in my life right now is just figuring out what's not mine's and what is mine and working through, but also seeing it and not, and, and also seeing the good parts about my, my, my pops and also that hurt little boy, you know what I'm saying? That is sort of like wounded as like this man, you know what I'm saying? So um, I've never said that publicly before, you know what I'm saying? And, um, but I, I think that's where I'm at, you know? And I know that, you know, a few more years and, and and I know it's 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 lifelong work, you know. So that five years just gave me the letter, but I think this work is continuous, you know. It's it's lifelong and it's very important. So thank you for, for stepping up to the plate and being um, in this space to to care for our community. Um, you know, the the podcast is really called Are You Being Gentle With Your Mental, which was really a self reflective moment that I had within the pandemic that I really want to start conversations and turn into a podcast. So I, I must ask you, you know, how do you stay gentle with your mental? I think that's a, a brilliant question. Um, I don't think enough, 
But in the moments that I do, I think it's when I, I take myself up for a walk or get active. Or, you know, I, lo I love the water and I can't travel right now. Um, but there's like Lake Ontario or different lakes or whatever, you know. But I mean, I used to love going back to either Jamaica or the Caribbean once a year just to be by the sea water. And that would be just to sort of pray in the water and connect with Mother Nature and the ancestors and myself um, in nature. But I think going around, you know, you know, I think what I do have is like the ability to walk around my, ne my neck of the woods or there's like, you know, in, in Scarborough and the part of Toronto I'm at, there's a lot of like forests and like beautiful sceneries and trails. So it's like going to those spots, I find extremely rejuvenating. Um, and it helps me ground in my body, which I, I feel like I need to do in my old age, you know? That's beautiful. I literally can resonate with mindful walking. I love getting outdoors and just, you know, soaking up with the sun and hearing like the nature birds chirping and just, just enjoying that bliss for that moment. And so I definitely, I, I do the same for, for my gentleness uh, with my mental, but you know, as we wrap up this wonderful interview with you, I really want to know how can our listeners support you or even the club um, from from here on out? Yeah, as I mentioned, like, I think, um, you know, the next, you know, the Sunday dinners that happens at the last Sunday of every month. Um, so for this, for April, if, you know, it's April 26th. Um, the next month is May 30th. And then um, Sunday, June 27th. Um, or the next upcoming sessions. Um, I think, as I mentioned before, if folks are interested in, you know, you, know, you come up to a, a Sunday dinner, you're like, yeah, I like this vibe, but maybe open, I'm interested in maybe doing like my own chapter in my neck of the woods. I think definitely that's something we're interested in, you know, definitely um, connect with me. Um, but yo, I think it's just about coming out to the space. And I think it's, it's about like just connecting. Um, yeah, that's that's the main piece right now. That's the main piece. We're, we're in a growing state, so we're putting together advisory boards. Um, so if folks are interested to like, you know, give them mind power um, in terms of how we can sort of sort of grow Black Daddy's Club in an international um, way, definitely that's another place as well that we're looking for support and for folks to sort of come on board. Both men and women and non-binary folks are welcome, yeah? Perfect. Well, I'll definitely make sure we list all the resources in the show notes, you guys, so we can connect you with Brandon. Um, but I simply want to thank you for coming on, for being humble, open, and transparent on this uh, wonderful interview. I'm sending blessings to you and your family and continue to be well. Thank you very much. My podcast now has merch. Begin each day with the aura mug to remind yourself to connect with your senses. Take a mindful moment to check in with your mental thoughts, emotions, and or by asking yourself, are you being gentle with your mental? Which is featuring a unique design of hands protecting the divine energy of your brain. This mug empowers us to be kind with ourselves and others. Remember, we cannot pour from an empty cup. So may this cup always be filled with a flow of positive energy and you can purchase yours today or gift somebody by going on my website jessbeu.org and go ahead and support the mindful communities that we're building together peace and love y'all Thank you for watching the first visual of the podcast titled, Are You Being Gentle With Your Mental? This was season three, Activism Through the Arts in the first episode with Brandon Hay. Please hit that bell button to be notified when more videos and interviews drop from here on out and go to my website to get more insight to know who Jess the Best is. Peace out, y'all, and be gentle with your mental.